I'm Ludmil Alexandrov, a professor in cellular and molecular medicine and bioengineering at UC San Diego. So when we started this study, we wanted to answer the question, what causes lung cancer in people that have never smoked? Uh, we know in smoking, lung in smokers, lung cancer is preventable, but we were not sure whether in never smoker, lung cancer is preventable. So we wanted to understand that, and perhaps the most important thing of this study is we have identified a number of processes that can allow us to prevent lung cancer in never smokers. Never smokers are people who have never ever had tobacco cigarettes or have had less than 15 tobacco cigarettes in their lifetime. Now, they may have smoked, they have, may have done electronic cigarettes, they may have smoked other substances, but when it comes to tobacco cigarettes, they have had uh, either none or less than 15 cigarettes in their lifetime. It's people telling you, I have never ever smoked. And people sometimes don't remember they have smoked in their lifetime. And actually, from the genetic material of the cancer and their lung tissue, we can say whether they have smoked before or not. Because smoking leaves a very specific patterns of mutation and molecular changes. So we have the self-reporting type of information, but in addition to that, we can actually trace it back and say, hey, we see some genomic signatures there. Are you sure you've never smoked? And some of them have come and said, oh, actually, I smoked when I was a teenager, but completely forgot about it. Now I'm 75. And, and so it's the self-reporting plus as double and triple checking. We actually collected samples from uh, lung cancer patients that have never smoked. Uh, and we collected it from 28 different locations around the world, and we collected almost 900 such samples. And we specifically designed the study in such a way that people are coming from places that have low air pollution and places that have higher pollution, allowing us to compare what is different in their cancers. In addition for that, for some of those people, about 450 of them, we had an information whether people were smoking in their household or not, which allowed us to do the additional comparison of passive smoking or secondhand smoking to see whether it does anything uh, uh, to the cancers. How does one quantify air pollution? If I were to ask you, what's the air pollution you have been exposed in your lifetime? It's a very hard question to answer. But what you can do is you can look at the addresses a person has lived, on the locations, and then one can use satellite images that can measure the air pollution at different times, and then one can derive an average index or an average value of the air pollution one has been exposed throughout one's lifetime. So we essentially that's what we did for these 800 and something patients. We used satellite images with ground measurements to derive an individual air pollution index. And we wanted to see whether that associates with any mutations or any genomic changes that we see in the cancers of these people. So specifically, we looked at PM 2.5 particles, which are particles that are 2.5 micrometers or less in diameter, uh, and which have been previously implicated, or it was suggested that they're implicated in lung cancers. We have had air pollution for a long time, uh, but there are also, we have had tobacco smoking being quite prevalent for a long time. So, in the last several decades, the tobacco smoking associated lung cancers have decreased, and we have been able to see the emergence of lung cancer in never smokers. Lung cancer in general has been traditionally associated with tobacco smoking. Indeed, 70 to 80 percent of all lung cancers are associated with tobacco smoking. Now, in the past few decades, we have made significant advances towards reducing tobacco smoking, and we are now seeing more and more lung cancer in never smokers. They are emerging uh, as one of the dominant uh, uh, lung cancer types because less people are actually smoking. But not only that, we're thinking that we think that they're increasing, and this could be due to the increase of number of habits or a number of environmental uh, factors, such as air pollution, uh, but it could be due to other things that we haven't previously measured. Previously, what we have known about air pollution and lung cancer in never smoker is we have known that there is an epidemiological association between those two uh, factors. And we have also known from uh, work in mouse models, we have known that 
this could be reproduced experimentally. But we haven't been sure how this occurs in humans, or what does air pollution causes in human beings. Now, in this study, we had that power to understand that. And in fact, we can see that the more polluted region one lives in, or the more polluted region one comes from, uh, the more mutation one has in their lung. We don't only see that difference between low and high polluted areas, we also see a very, very strong dose-response association. And we also see that the, some of the main drivers that cause lung cancer are in fact being enriched in people who come from these highly polluted areas. So now, in addition to the associations that we have, we have a mutagenic mechanism that air pollution is associated with mutagenesis in lung cancer, which is causing the mutations and driving the cancer development and cancer evolution. But in addition to that, we found at least two things that we, found, that we thought are very exciting and completely unexpected. Uh, the first one that we found was that uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Taiwan, we would see a very specific sets of mutations in the lung cancer of never smokers. And indeed, we know the cause of this, and that's a Chinese traditional medicine that contains something called some plants uh, uh, with aristolochic acid. And we do not know the exact mechanism by, by which the people take that, but we suspect that they may be inhaling them as part of uh, traditional practices, and that is mutating their lung, and again, increasing their uh, uh, their chance of developing lung cancer. So now we are talking about a very specific regional exposure or even in a country level exposure because we saw it in almost all samples that we look at from Taiwan uh, that is potentially preventable. Here one can have an immediate personal action of not inhaling such traditional medicine uh, but one can also have also regulation and changes that can be implemented. The second thing that was unexpected was across most of the lung cancer in never smokers, we found an unknown mutational process. We don't know what causes it. The fact that it's across all of them tells you that it's probably something endogenous to the lung, but it tells you that there is something that's accumulating mutations, like a ticking time bomb with age, and that's generating many of the potential cancer drivers. So again, something very interesting, something potentially preventable. It was seen regardless of where they live. That signatures of a known origin was seen everywhere. So it's something globally ubiquitous, because we have 28 locations around the world uh, across a number of countries. So everyone had them, but they had them at different rates in the different countries. So it tells you that there is something that can be modulated. So probably something inside the lung, something inside of the lung cells that can be affected by the environmental factors. So the story of aristolochic acid is a very interesting story. We have first learned about it from a Belgium health, uh, weight loss clinic in the 90s. Women were taking specific Chinese herbal medicine to lose weight. Well, it turns out that herbal medicine is very mutagenic and very carcinogenic, so it causes mutations in cancer. So these women started having kidney failures and started developing kidney and liver cancers. And that's when we learned about this Chinese herbal medicine causing many cancer types. Subsequently, it's been shown to be a big problem in Southeast Asia, in Eastern Europe, uh, where we are seeing most of the kidney cancers, most of the liver cancers having this exposure. So we're talking about nationwide or population-wide exposure to this specific Chinese herbal medicine. In Southeast Asia, in China, we know they this is being consumed through traditional medicine. We see it in Eastern Europe and we have honestly no idea how this is being consumed there. It's not through traditional medicine, it might be through brewing specific moonshines and things like that. But it's, it's quite fascinating to think about. Again, you're talking about whole countries being exposed to that. Now, we have known that this causes kidney, we have known that this causes liver, we have had some reports it causes bladder cancers. By far, this is the first report saying that it causes lung cancer, uh, and specifically lung cancer in never smokers. Now, we do not think that just consuming it will cause lung cancer. We, needs, we think that there needs to be an inhalation process. So we suspect that there is some inhalation of this Chinese herbal medicine that's mutating the lung of people. We see it very strongly in Taiwan. We do not see it in samples from Hong Kong, uh, and we don't have samples from mainland China. We suspect we'll see it, but we just don't have the, the samples there. So we, we know it's something cultural, something related to, to, to most likely Chinese traditional medicine, 
but you know, honestly, we don't understand it at this moment. Uh, and we also know that Eastern Europeans don't have it because we have cancers from them. Lung cancer in general is, when we think about it, we think of disease of smokers. Most of the time, this will be males who smoke a lot. Lung cancer in never smokers, interestingly enough, is mostly a disease of females. And more specifically, we see a very high enrichment of females of Asian origin. Now, we do not know whether that's because of genetics, of the genetics of a uh, of person being Asian, or because of the people who lived in China, Southeast Asia, so it's an environmental. But we very, very clearly see that specific enrichment. So we have a very specific population. Now, again, we will see lung cancer in never smokers in Caucasian females, in African American, in males as well. But the predominant set of uh, uh, individuals that we'll see it, or the, 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 the enriched in, uh, population, will be f Asian females. There's some region specific hypothesis when it comes to Southeast Asia, when it comes to Taiwan women cooking on open fire, uh, uh, or, or women uh, uh, doing uh, maybe more inhalations than males. But the reality is, we don't know. Uh, because again, even when it comes to air pollution, well, males and females would live exactly in the same air pollution. It's, it's, it's not like uh, females breathe more of the air pollution than males. So that part is a bit mysterious. That part we don't understand. So what can we do based on the information of air pollution? It's a great question. Uh, the simple answer is, in, on an individual level, there is little one can do. On a more community, city, government level, one can, needs to start thinking more about regulating, more about reducing air pollution, more about making sure that some of the big cities are not that air pollution, there's not so much pollution, because in addition, to many other uh, uh, lung diseases, now we know that this is also very strongly causing mutations in the lung and causing lung cancer. So there is a lot when it comes, but it's a lot that can be done, but it doesn't come on the individual level, unfortunately. It comes on the level of we need to be able to reduce the air pollution and essentially have clean air so we and our children breathe better. This study has a number of limitations that we need to keep in mind. Um, the first limitation is when it comes to air pollution, we have derived a personalized index, and this is an estimation. Ideally, one would wish to have every person wear a specific device that measure how much the air pollution they consume or they inhale during their lifetime. Practically, it's not a very realistic thing to do, or such data doesn't exist. Similarly, for the secondhand smoke, we have relied on multiple surveys of people self-reporting it. Again, people can make mistakes, people may, can misreport it, and we have tried to account for that, but there is always the chance that there is some misreporting in the data. Um, the other and third limitation I should point out is there's other known factors that cause lung cancer, such as radon exposure, or such as some industrial exposures or occupations. We did not explore that specifically, uh, and that was something that we're hoping to do in future studies. In this study, we have focused to understand specifically air pollution and secondhand smoking. Um, and we have found interesting things related to Chinese herbal medicine and potentially unknown mutagenic process. Uh, but we haven't explored several things, which we are hoping to explore in the future. The first thing that we haven't explored is specific exposure, such as radon, or specific occupations that may lead to higher uh, lung cancer in never smokers. The other thing that we hope to explore is is electronic cigarettes and smoking marijuana. Because we are seeing the population changing their behavior from smoking tobacco cigarettes to actually vaping electronic cigarettes or to smoking marijuana. And we want to understand the risk. We know there will be risk. We know that there will be probably some increase in cancer risk and mutations. We just don't know what it is. And that's one of the things we are actively working on.